Come on, Jamie. You got this. I don't know why you're so nervous, man. You've done this before, you know? There's no one in the world better than you at this. No one. Okay. There's a few people better than you, but that's fine. What would the research tell you to do? What would the research say if you're nervous before a speech? What do you do? God, what does it say? I know. Power pose. What's going on YouTube? Jamie Potter here, PhD in organizational behavior from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And in this channel, my goal is to unlock the value of research for organizations. And in this second episode, I am talking to you about what turns out to be a pretty controversial idea in the literature, and that is power posing. So what exactly is power posing? So the idea was first introduced in a, what turned out to be a pretty influential paper in 2010 by Dana Carney, who was the first author, this is an important detail that will come up later, Amy Cuddy and Andy Yap. And so the idea was sort of a simple one. We know from decades of research that the mind influences the body. And in terms of power, what this means is that if you are a powerful person or you feel powerful, it often influences how you hold your body. In terms of business, the way we think of this is the person who's powerful is sort of sitting at the end of the table, arms outstretched by their side, maybe feet are up on the desk, right? We know that causation goes this way. The question these researchers were trying to tackle was, does causation also go the other way? In other words, does how I hold my body influence my mind? If I sit with this expansive posture, or as power posing has sort of become synonymous with, if I stand before a meeting or before a speech in sort of the superhero pose, will that influence my mind such that I feel feel more powerful? And does it actually change my physiology in some way? Does it change my hormones and my behavior in ways that will be beneficial for the upcoming presentation or speech or meeting? And so this idea though, that the body influences the mind is not altogether new. In fact, there's a very famous older paper, which shows when you have people hold a pen or a pencil in between their teeth, such that it forces them to smile, they actually feel happier. And so, okay, ah, let's try it out. Okay. So I have this pen here and I hit it and I hit it on teeth and it's really, it's forcing me to smile. And uh, apparently I should feel happier. Actually, I just, I, I you know, I feel kind of ridiculous, so. Yeah, okay, anyway. That old study shows that and it shows that your body influences your emotions and your mood. But the question these three authors, Carney, Cuddy, and Yap were trying to tackle in 2010 was that does it also influence your behavior and your physiology or your hormones in some way? And so what these three researchers actually find is that indeed the way you hold your body, if you hold it in sort of this powerful way or in a power pose with a very expansive posture, it does actually influence one, not only your feelings of power, but also your subsequent behavior in that you're more willing to take financial risks as well as your physiology in that from your baseline, when you entered the lab for this study, your testosterone is actually higher. Testosterone being, you know, I feel more confident, more aggressive, and your cortisol or your stress hormone is actually lower. Importantly here, so it looked at a multiple different dependent variables, right? Feelings of power, behavior, and physiology. I should note as the quotes here show that the contribution of the study, which will be important down the road for this story, was indeed that power posing influences your behavior and your physiology. So all is well, right? Super interesting paper, how you hold your body actually influences hormones and behavior. We didn't know that before. The paper turns out as of now, it's been cited over 1100 times on, according to Google Scholar, which is quite a bit. But the story starts to get interesting in 2012 because Amy Cuddy, the second author here, did a TED talk, right? Talking about power posing and really highlighting especially the contribution of the study. The fact she shows a couple graphs, the only one she shows are the fact that power posing influences behavioral risk taking, as well as testosterone and cortisol, right? And this TED talk absolutely blew up. Everyone loves TED talks. This is the second most viewed of all time. People are still watching it. People are still power posing before meetings. It's a very heartfelt talk. I do recommend you check it out. But caveat here is that when something blows up, especially 
something from the literature blowing up just more in the world, other researchers start to jump on this and say, let's really test this. Let's make sure this is a robust effect. In other words, let's try to replicate this, as they say. And so this is actually what started to happen. People started to look more closely at the results of the study and they found a number of things that were not ideal. For one, the biggest thing being that there were only 42 participants in this experiment, which is not ideal. It's kind of a small number. So that started to make people suspicious. And so what happened in 2015 was the first sort of high profile replication study that was done. They brought in 200 people. They really tried to follow the procedures from the original experiment as closely as possible with a number of changes that they cite in their paper. And what they find actually, unfortunately, is that remember the original paper found effects of power posing on feelings of power, on behavior and risk-taking and on physiology. They unfortunately, these authors in 2015 of the replication study were not able to replicate the effects of power posing on behavior and physiology. They were actually able to replicate the impacts of power posing on feelings of power. However, it did sort of feel like a failed replication in a lot of ways, considering the original contribution of the 2010 study was to show how power posing impacts more interesting dependent variables like behavior and physiology. But now these authors are sort of feeling under attack, right? Especially Amy Cuddy, who has become famous from power posing. We have this study that's saying, is it really real? So Amy Cuddy got back together with Dana Carney and another author to publish a study that sort of reviewed all of the papers, not just one failed replication, but all of the papers from 2010 to 2015 on power posing. Because what they were saying is the reason your one paper failed to replicate is because you did certain things differently than we did. I know you outlined them in the paper, but these differences are the things that caused the study to not replicate. So we're gonna outline all 33 papers that have been published in the past five years and really narrow in on the procedures of each so that hopefully as researchers, we can learn which procedures really matter, which things are important in real life to make power posing work, which has really practical implications, right? If I'm using it, I wanna make sure I'm doing it in the right way and with the right procedures so that it does make me more confident and it does increase my testosterone. So in this paper, they lay out all 33 studies in a really convincing way and say, in the future, we need to do more research. We appreciate these authors of this failed replication for doing this, but we need to advance the field and keep studying power posing. But if you think it ends there, you're wrong. Because what comes out after, in about 2017, Two authors, in fact, one of my old professors, Yuri Simonson and Joe Simmons from the Wharton School, now decide let's look at all of the research in a more rigorous way. I know Amy Cuddy and Dana Carney in 2015 pulled all these studies and sort of did a qualitative review to say how they're different and which procedures matter for power posing's impact. But what Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson did is what's called a P curve which is a really interesting idea they developed to kind of look at a research body, right? And to see if it is actually real. Is there evidential value in this research body? And the way they do it, I won't go into too much detail because it's fairly statsy and boring, and this is not a boring channel, is they look at the p-values for all of the studies that have been published. The p-value, if we remember our high school stats class, is the way that we can tell if an effect is real or not, or if it's statistically significant or not. And a p-value below 0.05 means it is significant. A p-value above 0.05 means it's not significant and we can't publish this. So what they do in looking at this p-curve is they array all of the p-values from every single study done, and they look at the distribution of those. And in short, it's a bit more complicated, but in short, if a lot of the p-values cluster around sort of 0.04, they're just below the threshold of 0.05, the body of research is questionable because what may have been done, also a topic from Yuri Simonson, is what's called p-hacking. This is what researchers sometimes do in order to get that p-value under the 0.05 threshold. That might involve throwing out participants. That might involve adding different control variables 
to your equations so that all playing around with it so you can see where the p-value goes. And as soon as it gets below 0.05, even if it's 0.048, it's publishable, great. Let's go forward with it. So that's fine, right? Sort of a complex statsy paper says this body of research isn't real, blah, 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 who cares? But bigger problem is in 2017 as well, Dana Carney on her website actually posts something on power posing. It's still there to this day. You can look it up and says power posing is not real. She actually goes through and outlines all of the procedures they used to actually p-hack the results. And to be fair, she's the first author, right? So she's saying she was involved too, but she's saying given what we know now about how research should be done, given what we've learned over the past seven years, I personally don't believe power posing is real, despite being the first author, meaning I was sort of the one who conceptualized things, who did a lot of the writing and theorizing. She said, I take it back. I'm no longer doing research on this. I do not believe the impact is real. It doesn't appear the same thing occurred for Amy Cuddy, right? Because Amy Cuddy, the next year, with actually two different authors, Dana Carney was no longer a part of things. Amy Cuddy published a paper now doing another p-curve, but adding the more recent papers that have done been done on power posing to do a more systematic review. And what she finds, I mean, it's, this is where things really get interesting. It's sold as, look, power posing is real. We've taken all the studies. We did another p-curve. This p-curve in this case with the additional studies shows there is an effect of power posing. But importantly, if you read it, the impact of power posing now is only on feelings of power. Now that is important because going back to the original 2010 study, the contribution of power posing is to show that it influences behavior and hormones. But now fast forward eight years with all this controversy and now the best we can say is that power posing robustly impacts feelings of power, to me is not a win, right? I don't think that is to say that power posing is real. I mean, the 2018 paper goes through and has really convincing social psychological arguments that the whole point of social psychology is to say that your emotions and your mood actually impact your behavior. So if power posing impacts emotions and mood, it should impact behavior, but it, but it doesn't though. So that actually is a bit of a problem for power posing. So we have here nearly a decade of controversy, right? You don't often see something like this in the research where this little paper that's kind of interesting blows up into this worldwide phenomenon where it's in movies, it's in TV shows, Oprah's talking about it, it's on CNN, and then the years pass and this sort of cloud forms over it, questioning the results, right? This seems more like a reality TV show or a soap opera, but alas, this is research. And where we stand now is yes, and I agree, power posing does have a robust impact on feelings of power and certain emotions as well. But again, this was not the original intended contribution of it. So we have to wonder is power posing really real? That is all for me. I hope you enjoyed this narrative. I hope it got you thinking about power posing and sort of research in general and this idea of replication. It's become a big problem in social psychology, kind of the humanities in general of do these effects replicate? And if they don't replicate, does that mean the whole body of literature that we're sitting on is kind of tenuous? Really interesting topics to think about. I'm done for now. I'll be back next week with more ideas. And hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you found it helpful. Leave comments below, hit the like button, subscribe as well. And I'll be doing this each week. Thanks.